We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz <coughs> Archive. We are in Delaware Water Gap at the Deerhead Inn, and I'm very fortunate to have one of America's great musicians, Phil Woods, clarinetist, saxophonist, and composer, sometimes journalist, you just mentioned. Well, so, occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Appreciate you coming and uh, chatting. Glad to do it. A couple of weeks ago, when we had a brief conversation on the phone, you said you were taking time these days to do some writing and kind of reflecting. And what do you reflect and write on these days? Oh, how lucky I am to uh, make a living doing something I love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, having a wonderful supportive family. Uh, living in a wonderful part of the world where uh, a lot of young people know who Charlie Parker was and John Coltrane. We have a uh, uh, Delaware Water Gap. Uh, you might not be aware of it, but uh, this, this venerable institution we're sitting in right now, the Deerhead Inn, has had jazz for over 50 years. Uh, Chris and Donna Solid, they run uh, three nights, at least three nights a, a week, so, uh, Friday and Saturday, and usually a matinee type thing on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been some great, great jazz played here. And uh, as a direct result of some of the jam sessions, I remember one night a jam session, yeah, there must have been 10, 15 saxophone players. And I said to Rick Chamberlain and Ed Joe Bear, I said, we should move this outside. You know, this was about 22 years ago. Uh -huh. And that led to the, I don't know if you notice the stage across the street, we have a celebration of the arts, which is held every year. So I was reflecting on all these, these good things that are, mm -hmm. that are going on. So, briefly, that's what... You feel jazz is uh, healthier today than, than it has been in the past? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not really healthier? Yeah. yeah. I think it's become... Uh, oh, I don't mean to paint a bleak picture, but... Jazz seems to have lost its cutting edge. It seems to be a regressive mode act activated somehow. Um, I mean, jazz still goes on, and it's never been so alive and well. We've never had so many kids playing music, and this is a positive thing. I, I don't mean uh, to negate the, the import of uh, a kid picking up an instrument, because if he's got an instrument in his mouth, he's probably less liable to buy a, 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 an assault rifle, you know? I mean, I think music is good, and any cutting back of funds for music education is a big mistake, which we're also mm -hmm. getting involved in. But uh, the idea of, the, of, of jazz being alive and well, every campus has a jazz program, every school has a, has a jazz program. But I don't hear it. I just don't hear the, what, I mean, I, I came, I was the, the last generation to come up and actually learn from the masters direct. I mean, my first band was Quincy Jones and Dizzy Gillespie and Monk right. Band. I mean, I got a chance to really, you know, one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the masters. Uh, I'm not saying, and I'm not indicting jazz education. I think it's a great thing. But uh, a university should, should reflect the needs of society, you know? And society doesn't need quite as many tenor players as we're graduating. <laughs> I mean, what we... Yeah. I'd like to find a gig for all of those tenor right. players, you know? And now the gigs, the jazz gigs, I mean, everybody's still playing Scrapper from the Apple and Stella by Starlight and the old war horses, you know? Which is fine and good, but jazz should be more cutting edge. Jazz should be more now. Uh, I don't hear anybody doing like what Dolphy did or what Ornette did. Mm -hmm. I love what John Zorn is doing, which I don't know if you call it jazz. But I think the musician of the future is not going to be just a, a jazz type of person. I think it's going to be more, I mean, a, a, a typical set might be a tango of Astro Piazzolla, a bossa mm -hmm. nova, uh, some uh, pygmy music from Africa, a little Charlie Parker, a little free Archie Shep. Uh, I mean, it's kind of become so collated and codified that everybody now has the same real book, the same fake books. This is good, but it's not, it should be more, it should be more aggravating. It should stick in the craw. It's, it's too acceptable, you know? It's not, it's, it's lacking color and it's lacking a bit of humor. It doesn't quite have the humor. I mean, where are the Zoot Simses and the Al Collins, you right. know? Yeah. Al Collins, like, uh, 
in Copenhagen, they said, Al, have you tried the elephant beer? And, and Al came back and said, I drink to forget, man. You know, I mean, I don't hear that. But the, I mean, God bless the kids, you know, but too many three-piece suits and managers, you, you know? You think it's trying to, that part of that comes from trying to find its marketplace? To, oh, I'm to sure that's a lot, a lot to do with it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. There's a couple of statements I've read uh, that were kind of humorous from you yourself about part of jazz education should be getting on a bus, uh, well, and riding I've... around. You know. <laughs> yeah, get, get fitted out with, uh, get some ill-fitting uniforms. You know, uh -huh. very uncomfortable. You know, the the lightweight in the winter, the heavy weight in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> A bus whose windows don't open, no air conditioning, no Walkmans allowed. Oh. Uh, everybody's got a double. You know, you got all the sax ones got to have at least four or five cases to carry, and a big, thick book of about 400 charts. Put everybody on the bus and just drive around in circles on the campus for about 12, 15 hours. You know, <laughs> then get off the bus. Everybody put on these terrible uniforms. You know, call out a set, and the book is never in order. Mm -hmm. It's like Gene Quill style, you know, 1, 2, 47, 93, 207, 5. <laughs> Call out the set real quick. 7, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, you know, everybody gets their, all their instruments out, you know. Okay, put the instruments back, put the music back, and we put your book in order, hang up your suit, get back on the bus, drive around for another 12, 15 hours, you know. Do it once again. Mm -hmm. And I think you might cut cut the wheat from the shaft, you know. <laughs> See how many kids now, graduate who wants now. Wants to do this. I mean, it's an exaggeration, but yeah. all all points is because there are no more big bands where you could even right. do this conceivably. Right. But I mean, that's the way it used to be. I don't yeah. think it has to be that way. But nevertheless, the hardest part of the music business is the traveling, whether yeah. it's a bus or a plane or just just the, the idea of existing. You know, I mean, it yeah. ain't about playing. The playing is easy. It's all the nonsense you go through to to bring your horn up to the bandstand. That, mm -hmm. That's that's the only, that's the altar, that's the safe place. Well, you um, had said in one of your liner notes from a recent CD that uh, there's only a handful of players that change jazz history. Essentially, I think that's well, Without uh, me stroking your ego or anything, where do you think you fit in there? Well, I'm a practitioner. I've never changed jazz history. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I am a bearer of the flame. I like to keep the bebop flame uh, uh, alive in that mm -hmm. sense. But I don't just play bebop. I, 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 I could conceivably we play that, that dream set I was talking about, of playing a Piazzolla. Yes. And, uh, the very, I, I kind of, I like to consider myself a complete musician yeah. uh, since I'm classically trained. Uh, uh, but as far as finding any new way, I've, I mean, if I could have changed the course of Western music, I would have done so years ago. <laughs> well, one thing I have to, I would say that I always enjoy about your albums is you seem to really like to have some of your own, not only your own compositions, but your own arrangements. And, and when you do an album, it sounds like you have a band. Yeah, well, whether, that's, yeah. You know, whether, it's, whether it's with the quintet, which has been... Uh, Anything that the quintet records is uh, has been well rehearsed on the road and performed mm -hmm. a, a, a few hundred times before we even went to the mm -hmm. studio. So when we when we do record, we record as if it was a concert. I mean, we don't need require more than one or two takes tops. Yeah. Uh, but even other recordings, recordings that I would do as a guest, I'm I like to think I'm, I'm well prepared before I go in. I do a lot of research. I, I like to find tunes I haven't done before that nobody else has done. Or something, mm -hmm. something different, something imaginative. To, to, not interested in just going down memory lane again. You know? Yeah, and, and digging out some of those unplayed uh, verses to, to speak. Yeah, the verses, and, the, know. the great American songbook. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, they're just uh, the obscure Ellington. There's so much music. We don't have to just keep playing all the things you are. I mean, we, right. as much as I love it, but there are other chestnuts to fry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just zoom through a couple of things here. You, sure. You said you took some lessons because your oh. uncle passed a saxophone on to you, and it <laughs> seemed like the proper thing to do. <laughs> yes, it did. Well, as my mother put it, uh, my uncle died and left me the saxophone, and I just kind of stuck it in the closet. And my mother said, you know, he went to a great deal of trouble to leave you the saxophone. And, and even at the age of 12, I realized that dying could be considered a great deal of trouble. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so I, I, 
my, my, my mom, she said, uh, well, Philip, you should at least perhaps take a lesson, you know, and see what you, see what you think. So I said, okay, Mom, you know. And I knew nothing of, of, the, of, of music. I mean, I thought you had to be anointed or something before oh. I even could touch the horn. And I looked in the yellow pages and just called a music store and got a saxophone teacher. And I got the greatest teacher I've ever got played. I mean, I've had a lot of teachers, but I never got a better one than mm. this one I just found by accident in the yellow wow. pages. His name was Harvey LaRose out of Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And he was, and I remember so, like it was yesterday, uh, I said, Mr. LaRose, should I bring the saxophone? You know, I was a real natural. <laughs> he said, young man, it would be a good idea to bring the saxophone to your first saxophone lesson, <laughs> you know. So uh, that's what I met. I met the, the greatest, one of the greatest men I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Played guitar, he played flute, he played piano, he played sax, he arranged. Not a great improviser, but he knew he knew chords. Mm -hmm. So after I was studying for about, I would say six months. I mean, in the beginning, I would I would go in for a lesson, and we'd go through the root bank, the basic stuff, and I'd go and put the horn back in the closet. I would go back and I would go out and play baseball. But the following week, I'd go for a lesson, and I could play the lesson. I mean, I didn't think anything of it. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate, and in, in, in Harvey was not only a great teacher, he was a very wise man in the fact that I was faking it, man. I mean, if I had a more, a more traditional type of teacher, a more old-fashioned type of teacher, who could have discouraged my efforts. So how dare you, you're using your ear to play music, you know? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, there, are, there, sure. there were such Especially animals, piano, you know, I think yeah. that's... Yeah. Uh, so, so Harvey recognized the fact that I must have a fair retentive ability and a darn good ear if I could play the lesson and he knew I wasn't practicing. The teacher mm -hmm. can always tell whether you're practicing or not. So I was, uh, it wasn't long before I was smitten. I mean, I loved it. I mean, he was so, so good as a teacher that I fell in love with, with the idea of playing and I got very good at it. And my lessons within, within a few, few short months, I was, uh, Harvey would give me the four pop songs of the week and he would play the piano. He would have come to me at the piano. And these were all standards. I mean, that's, I mean, I was learning standards at the age of 12, 13 years old, and he would, he would tell me what the chords were and what the scale possibilities were. Mm. I mean, I mean, fantastic improvisation lessons, you know. And I graduated high school at the age of uh, 16, and uh, I wanted to go on with my music education. And, and you ended up at uh, Julia? I went to Manhattan School of Music for a summer course. I wanted to be in New York, that's where Charlie Parker was. Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't really tell Mama. <laughs> I had a, you know, kind of, I, I wanted to study too. I really wasn't sure about the jazz thing. I, I know I wanted to be a musician, but I didn't know about the jazz thing. I knew it was going to be rough. But I did want to mm -hmm. learn more about music. And in, in those days, there was no other way to learn music except uh, in the conservatory or th through, the more, through the classical right. regime. I mean, there was no... Uh, Jazz. A few. Manus School was starting up. There was a few jazzy type of schools, yeah. but it wasn't quite. Didn't have the impact that it does today. Well, in fact, you had to major in the clarinet, didn't you? To, to yes. To Juilliard. Yes. Uh, as, as, as far as I know, there was not a saxophone major. Mm -hmm. I've since checked it out, and it seems like there was a saxophone major. Maybe I just wasn't aware of it at the oh. time. But it was. If if uh, it was. It was fairly new in the curriculum at any rate. It wasn't in the catalog that I ever saw. I think Joe Allard was the first teacher there, and that was mm -hmm. about, it might have been the year I actually went. But I was not interested in playing classical saxophone. Uh, it's a limited repertoire. Yeah, a bit of an oxymoron almost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but clarinet, I mean, yeah. uh, I think it served me well. I mean, I, I could play uh, work on my Mozart, with the keyboard stuff, work on Bach and fugal technique, and. Haunt the composer's workshops. And I heard uh, John Cage lecture. I heard uh, one of the early performances of the Concord Sonata. I saw the a premiere of uh, the Rake's Progress, Stravinsky. I used to haunt the composer's composer forum over mm -hmm. Columbia. Uh, heard Ustachevsky's first tape experiments and the first music called Cree. Wow. And, uh, the, the, the composition class. I was very interested in writing music, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Percy Caddy, Henry Brandt, William Schumann, who was uh, Peter Menon, who was my teacher. 
Uh, just an incredible staff. That's what I really enjoyed. I, I sort of minored in composition. Mm -hmm. And I pretended to be constipated for the rest of the time for <laughs> playing the clarinet. <laughs> yeah. But I was like 14th in line for the training orchestra, so I didn't get a whole lot of ensemble work there. But so I, I would, you know, at night I would study uh, bebop, Charlie Parker, have the radio on, listen to broadcasts from Birdland, and do my species counterpoint exercises. <laughs> and then the next day I'd work on Mozart and Brahms. So. <laughs> You had it surrounded. I, I, and I was in the middle of New York City when it, where, where it was all happening. So yeah. I, I, I was blessed in that in that sense of being. Talk about it being tempered in the kiln. I mean, uh, that was a hot place to be in, uh, in the late forties. Yeah, and in some of the, you were playing with Charlie Barnett on and off. Uh, and I was. I took a leave of absence my last year of Juilliard to go on the road with Barnett. I started off on fourth tenor, and then on the second tour, I was playing lead alto. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my final exam coincided with the, we were doing a week at the Apollo Theater, which is 125th Street. And Juliet is 122nd Street. Yeah. Pretty close geographically, but philosophically, <laughs> hundreds of miles apart. But uh, yeah, it was very interesting. That's interesting time. to very. think about that. You know, you, you're going to do your final exam and this whole kind of world right here, and then walk three blocks down there. Well, yeah. And you got it. Well, the problem was, you see, that like, between shows, I was practicing, I was practicing, I was doing the Stravinsky Three and the Company, I was going to be the first guy to ever play that at Juilliard, uh, to my knowledge, anyway. I was doing the Brahms and the Mozart, Brahms F minor, and I was practicing at uh, the Apollo between shows, and I thought I had my clarinet hidden away pretty carefully. So when I showed up for the morning show, and then I had a, a time to go to my final exam between shows, my clarinet was stolen. That was not a good point, but it all worked out. But that was, a that, was that was very strange. I have to show up for my exam and say, I can't take my exam. My clarinet was stolen. My teacher flipped out. You know, oh. it was a rather bleak day yeah. in Black Rock. Well, what point um, in all this musical activity did you decide, or did you decide, that you were going to make a career out of jazz playing? Was it a conscious decision, or did it kind of just fall in your lap? I wanted to be a musician, uh, and I kind of fell into the studio thing. And I could, I could always jam. I mean, Springfield, Massachusetts, back in those days, we had a little bebop band with Sal Salvador, guitar player with Kenton. Mm -hmm. Joe Morello, who became Brubeck's drummer, take the famous Take Five solo is Joe Morello. Uh, Chuck Andrews on bass, he was with, with Woody Herman's band when uh, Nat Pierce was the piano player. And uh, who am I leaving out? Oh, Hal Sarah, a very fine piano player. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, and Al Bryant on trumpet, who, who used to, I think he's maybe still out there, uh, contracting for uh, Lionel Hampton's band. So we had a little bebop, a little bebop band at that time. In fact, Hal Sarah and I used to come to New York to study with Tristano. Hal started studying with Tristano, and I said, I need to take some lessons. So mm -hmm. prior to, to moving to New York for the uh -huh. for that summer course in Manhattan, I was commuting from Springfield to uh, take lessons with Tristano. So I guess I always wanted to be a jazz man. I didn't think I was really worthy. You know, I mean, I didn't know whether I had it. I, I mean, I had the same doubts any young person yeah. does. You know, you're not, yeah. you don't know how you are until you get out there and compete. But uh, one thing I learned at Juilliard was that, I mean, as a jazz man, I always felt, well, I can't be as good as these classical guys. You know, there, there's, there's always been that divide between yeah. the, uh, we play classical. But I mean, even though I was a clarinet major, I was still the guy that played the alto sax. Everybody, everybody knows who you are in a school situation. Yeah. You know, there's the and there's the lounge lizards, and then there's the beboppers and, and all that. But it, it it turned out that I mean, it, not competing, but being around all these other kids, <coughs> I found out I was better than I thought I was. I mean, I could play the piano. A lot of the violin players couldn't play the piano. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could play a little bebop, Bud Powell. But it served me very well for placement in my keyboard harmony class. I could at least get around and right. I could read because I worked at it. A lot of the fiddle players weren't, weren't so or classical people weren't quite that concerned about it. Whereas jazz men usually, most jazz cats have a very nice understanding of keyboard harmony. Right. You know, it's, it kind of goes with the turf. So yeah, indirectly, I always was aiming towards being a jazz man. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you saw? Uh, Charlie Parker play live, and did it uh, kind of effect did it have on you? Well, 
it's interesting because Harvey LaRose, the, the first music I ever played of jazz was he gave me transcribed Benny Carter solos. And then within about a, a, a week or two, within that month, Ellington came to town and I saw Hodges and Hodges stepped down and he played Mood to be Wooed. And my, my teacher, how wise he was, the week before I was given that for a lesson. Oh. So here I got a chance to see wow. Hodges. And then my friend Hal Sarah and I picked up the latest record of uh, this guy called Charlie Parker and it was Coco. And another record was Sean Nuff. Sean Nuff on one side and the other side I think was How High the Moon or maybe vice versa, but it was you know two different bands. And uh, that was it. I mean, between Benny Carter, Hodges, and, and Parker all in one dose, I said, yeah, <laughs> man, let me add it. I mean, my course was very clear, yeah. uh, especially after hearing Bird. First time I saw Bird, I guess it would be uh, Oh, 52nd Street, when I was studying with Tristano. Mm -hmm. That was prior, that was before, as I say, before I moved to New York. I was be 47, something like that, before I graduated. I was still in high school. And we'd come down, we'd take the bus to, to New York, and we'd have to take another subway out to Long Island, then a, tra then a bus to Lenny's house. Oh. And I forget what it was, it was $15 a lesson or something like that, which seemed like a lot of bread in those yeah. days. I'll take a lesson, then go back to Manhattan, go to Romeo's, get a bowl of spaghetti, and, and you knew it was fresh because it had been sitting in the window all day. <laughs> yeah. And then we go to Main Stem Records and get the latest Bud and Bird and Diz, whatever we could afford. And there was 78s, of course, in mm -hmm. those days. And if we still had a dollar left over, we go to 52nd Street. I could get a Coca Cola for a dollar, and I could sit there all night, man. That's amazing. And that's where I first heard uh, Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. I think he was sitting in with. Uh, who, Mill Jackson, I believe, and Howard McGee. Did he so sound as good yeah. there as he did on record? Yeah, he sure <laughs> did. He sure did. He sure did. What um, kind of person was he? Sweet. For you. Sweet. Yeah. Very nice. I, uh, and one day he asked me, did you, did you eat today, young man? I mean, he didn't know me from a hole in the wall, just yeah. another alto player, you know, licking at his heels. And he, he said, did you eat today? You know, the. The misconception is that Charlie Parker would, you know, stealing everybody's money and using it to buy drugs, but he was very nice to young musicians. Sometimes that's uh -huh. often overlooked. A, a little later on, which is my favorite, my only real Charlie Parker story, that, I mean, up close, I was working in a place called the Nut Club in the village, Sheridan mm -hmm. Square, playing for strippers, you know, Harlem Nocturne, 10 times a, a <laughs> night. In fact, this joint had so much class, they would hand you little wooden hammers as you walked in the door, you know, so you could beat the shit out of the table for your favorite stripper. You know? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody got a hammer. Like, not, not, to, not to, you know, they do that in Maryland, but it's to break crab claws. Yes. But this is just to beat the heck out of the table. <laughs> so somebody said birds across the street jamming. And he was over at Arthur's Cafe, Arthur's Bar, which is still there to this day. It's a little dinky joint. And I walked in and there was Bird and he was playing on a baritone sax. Now let me just preface this. At, this. at this period, I didn't know whether my mouthpiece was right. I didn't like the reed. I don't like this horn. No, it doesn't, it's not happening. I need new stuff, you know? Right. So I, I got up my nerves and said, Mr. Parker, perhaps you'd like to play, play my alto. And he said, that'd be very nice, son. Man, I ran across 7th Avenue and I got my horn and, I, and I'm sitting here. Bird was there and I was sitting there and the piano was there. Just, just a drummer and a piano, just a snare drum and a piano and a and bird. And I'm sitting there. I hand him the horn. He played long ago and far away, Jerome Kern. And I'm listening to this guy and it seems to me there's nothing wrong with my saxophone. <laughs> saxophone sounds pretty darn good, you know what I mean? And he says, now nah, you play. So, oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> When kids talk about being awestruck, I know about awestruck. <laughs> and I did my feeble imitation of Zef Master, and he said, sounds real good, son. Oh, oh man, this time I flew over 7th <laughs> Avenue, yeah. and I played the bejesus out of Harlem right there that <laughs> night. <laughs> but I mean, just those few words were, cement, were so important. So Great important. story. No more blaming it on the horn. No, the horn. The ligature and the, uh, yeah, the practice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you had mentioned Benny Carter, and uh, uh, one little interesting thing you said is he called you in 1961 for 
like a record date. Yeah, yeah. And uh, could you fit it into your Just schedule? Could I, I fit it into my busy yes. schedule? And yes. you said the only thing I have this month is an Italian wedding for scale. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's true. <laughs> it's true. So 61 was, was not kind of like a real busy... Well, I never... No, you got to remember that... I didn't play flute, so my studio days were, my studio work was limited in, mm -hmm. a, in a sense. I mean, I never did a Broadway show or that kind of thing. But you also got to remember that the new writers were coming in. I mean, at that point, we had uh, Ralph Burns, Al Cohen, Brooke Meyer, Manny Album, uh, oh, the list of, of writers in New York at that time is just incredible. You know, you name them, they were all there, and they wanted young, they didn't want the Sam Marowitz kind of old-fashioned oh. lead out, or they wanted the new kind of bebop thing. You know, I love Sam Marowitz, don't get me wrong, but they were looking for a little yeah. different stuff to serve the music. So I was always, uh, they would write me a clarinet part. I didn't have to worry about the flute for, for kind of the jazzier kind of things. Right. But that, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't every week. Yeah. yeah. What was scale back then? Oh, God, I don't <laughs> 40 bucks, something like that, for a three-hour session. Uh -huh. That number jumps into my head, it could yeah. be. Okay. Manny you used you on, uh, weren't you on that record? Uh, the oh, Loses lots. Everybody's Business. Yeah. And a lot of great Jazz stuff. Jazz Giants and yeah. Soul of the City. And, oh, I did all his, a lot of his stuff. Well, you found yourself in, in pretty good company very quickly. Uh, Quincy Jones uh, and Dizzy on those tours. So you were, what, in your early 20s then? Mm-hmm. Well, Birdland was also very important. I got a, I got to hanging out in Birdland, and on Monday nights, I uh, worked with uh, Jim Chapin. Jim Chapin had a band. Uh, uh, Billy Byers did the writing for it, and uh, Don Stratton on trumpet. And I got a little reputation. And uh, in 1956, I was invited to be a part of the Birdland All Stars. I did a thing with. Uh, East Coast, West, East Coast meets West Coast. It was Al Cohen and myself representing the East Coast. And I don't know how they figured these things out. And Kenny Durham and Connie Condoli, two trumpets and tenor and alto. And Manny Alba, Manny Wilkins did all the charts. And uh, that was my first real tour, you know, meet, meet in front of Birdland and get on the bus, man. I mean, uh, meet in front of Charlie's Tavern, I should say. Uh -huh. And I mean, there's Count Basie's band. There's Lester Young, there's Bud Powell, there's Sarah Vaughn. I mean, there's Count Pace. I mean, oh my God, Al Hibbler. I mean, you name it, there was all your heroes. You know, I get on the bus, well, where do I go? You know, you sit in the wrong seat, you're in big trouble. I mean, some of the Count Basie guys have been sitting in the same seat since the turn of the century. <laughs> and I hear a voice back here, Phil, and it was Al Cohn. And we had a seat over the wheel in the back of the bus, right behind. Bud Powell, Les Dion, right in front of us, man. So, I mean, that was... And uh, Quincy Jones heard me on that tour, and he was putting together, in 57, he was putting together a band for Dizzy for the Mideast tour. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he hired me for that. And Dizzy was very important. And, I mean, if, if you're good enough to work with Dizzy Gillespie, that does wonders for opening up other doors I for see. you. Yeah. Would you, did you like going overseas for the first time? Well, it's pretty weird. I mean, you know, first overseas trip, we landed in Abadan, Iran, you know. That was the first stop, you know. <laughs> Ten minutes later, Frank Riak is in an opium den. I mean, you know, I mean, it was happening, Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I mean, we were in, we were in all of the trouble spots of the world. Uh, Iran, uh, Syria, Beirut, uh, Baghdad, uh, oh, I'm leaving out a few, but I mean, mm -hmm. all the, I mean, they should have sent Dizzy a few more times. I think we could have yeah. saved a lot of trouble. Was the reception positive to the music? Dizzy always reached the people, yeah. Whether they understood jazz or not, they understood the rhythmical aspects uh -huh. of Dizzy's music, because Dizzy had so much rhythm, yeah. I mean, and, and his band also. In fact, there's a new record out to Disney in South America, which is the same band. If you haven't got it, check it out. Mm. Very exciting. So yeah, the people, I mean, they, they didn't really know what was happening, but they liked it. Did you have an opportunity at, at that time to like start submitting charts to some of these people, or your own writing? Yeah, I was... Yeah. Uh, I actually wrote a couple of things for Disney's band. We never got a chance to try them out, but Quincy... Quincy uh, and Ernie Wilkins were giving me a hand up uh, on the bus about, mm -hmm. about writing. 
And I did do some writing later when I joined Quincy's band, when that was in 59. Yeah. So yeah, I've always uh, tried to do some writing for whatever I, whoever I work with. Do you find it uh, helpful to write for individuals? Oh yeah, absolutely. Does it cause problems later though if someone else is well, then you, re, then you rewrite it. You rewrite it. <laughs> no, it's true. I do, do a lot of rewriting. Yeah. For, for make different copies, different. Right. Different. Uh, Imagine just like Ellington did. You know, when he had the different. Uh, well, whatever. Star yeah. Soloists. Yeah. yeah. There's a picture here. Well, it's nice to know who you're writing for. Yes. It is. That you probably recall from uh, the. Uh, Free and easy. Yeah. Free and greasy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's great, isn't it? What a what a cast. What a cast. That band lasted 10 months in Europe. We only lasted about five weeks in the States. Uh -huh. But there are a couple of records where you can get a chance to hear yeah. how good that band was. Yeah. But that band, one of the, the Billy Byers and Quincy did all the writing for the show. The show was a remake of uh, St. Louis Woman, all the uh, Harold Arlen songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we rehearsed at the Amer American Pavilion in uh, Brussels to get put the show together. We're talking here, uh, 59, 1959. Uh, so we rehearsed at the American Pavilion, and we had to memorize all of the charts. So it was a, one of the great moments of, of, of my life was uh, we'd show up at the theater for the morning's work, and there the, the dancers were blocking out, and the singers were working with the accompanists and all that. Saxophones would go here, trombones would go here, and the trumpets would go there, and the rhythm would go about their business. And uh, we'd see how much music we could memorize. And then we'd put it together after lunch, see uh -huh. how far, which section you get, the f wow. get to the furthest letter in the chart, mm -hmm. you know? And you'd be surprised, you do that for a couple of weeks, and the memory chops start to kick in. Mm -hmm. And we were chewing up music, the hardest part, and no conductor. I mean, I uh, Martha Flowers would drop her pinky and the woodwinds would hit, man. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, you had to be a musician uh -huh. to, I mean, you no, know, we were, we were behind the stairs in that picture. You might know the staircase. That's yeah. where the reeds were, and the trumpets were over here. So it was wow. impossible. I mean, we had to work out uh -huh. when she does that, we come in, you know. But it was great fun. The hardest part was when they'd have to do a rewrite. You'd have to forget what you just memorized and memorize a new one. That yeah. was that. <laughs> you get scrambled. But it wow. was great. It was great fun. Was that tough for Quincy to keep that large organization? Yeah. You know. <laughs> when the story is told, that's why Quincy is who he is. I mean, a lot of people say, why doesn't he do more for jazz? Man, you should... I remember we did a tour of Yugoslavia, one of the toughest tours I've ever been on in my life, to the same period. After, in other words, the show closed, I think the show lasted four or five months and it folded. It just never, never took off. It was much too hip for Europe. It didn't, oh. didn't uh, I mean, I didn't understand the jargon, you know, the hip talk and all that, because it was a black show, essentially. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we had a meeting and Quincy said, uh, if you guys want to stay together, I'll try to book, book the band. And we all said, yeah. I mean, nobody wanted to go home with a failed show. I mean, if we got a chance at uh, being a success. So Quincy did all of that himself, booking, making the phone calls and all that. I mean, I remember uh, one time we were so poor, I had my family over there and I called Quincy. I said, I don't have enough money to eat. He says, come to town, I'll give you half of what I got. He had 200 francs. He gave me 100. After this, this tough Yugoslavian trip that I mentioned, it was really rough. Uh, and there was not a whole lot of money. But Quincy, being a class act, instead of just throwing us on an airplane or a bus or whatever, he rented a, a car on the Orient Express. We had our own waiter, like mm -hmm. somebody to take care of us, you know, make up your beds and get your food and all that. And that was class. Yeah. You know. No, I've always said that uh, if Quincy calls and needs me, I'll be there in a minute oh. to play anything he wants. Uh -huh. So I love him. Cool. Did you get a taste of uh, of Europe that kind of made a good impression on you? So because you went back. Oh sure, I got a chance to realize that 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 uh, there's a different, there's another way. <laughs> it isn't yeah. just the American way. Uh -huh. there's, there's other ways of there's other democracies that are pretty darn good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I urge every. Uh, young artist or young person to jump on a trans, tramp steamer and go, go see how some other societies operate mm -hmm. with the same problems that we have. Yeah. Some of them uh, we could learn, we could learn so much 
from some of the smaller democracies, Denmark in particular, <coughs> Holland for its liberalism, uh, way ahead of us, way ahead of us. And, um, you know, every country, well, my God, what is it, 90% of all civilizations have uh, Medicare. It's a plan that's a lot superior to what we're we're mm. doing here. You know, I mean, they, they don't worry. They, they don't worry about that, especially in Scandinavia. It's from birth to to death. You're taken care of. You know, you pay a lot of taxes, but nobody goes broke if you get sick. You know, it's just uh, and their respect for the arts. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the average guy in, in France wants his daughter to marry a tenor man any more than an American <laughs> yeah. guy who works in a auto factory wants his daughter to marry a tenor man. But they, they realize the arts are important, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, they don't, when a building gets old, they don't just rip it down, you know, this, they're older and a little wiser. Yeah. America's still very young, and someday I hope that we, we become as uh, That's true, you know, become, you think uh, about Become it. as wise. Yeah, we're just kids. We're just yeah. kids. We're, we're, we'll, we'll get there. Right. We'll get there. I Did mean, you I have high hopes for this country. It's just that the growing pains are tough. Yeah. It's a huge democracy. Uh, it's a lot easier to manipulate a smaller democracy. I mean, of course, Holland and Denmark, and they work better. They got man, a tenth of the population yeah. than what we have. Right. But we're doing okay, but we got a long ways to go. And sometimes, sometimes it gets, seems like it'll never get done. But, yeah. but there is progress being made, and it's just going to take another couple hundred years, and we'll get somewhere. Did you notice any difference in the racial relations between the band members and the audience? In Europe? In Europe. Of course. Yeah. Well, we could all stay in the same hotel. Uh huh. I mean, in '56, if we went anywhere, if we went below Baltimore, the white guys would have to go to this hotel. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, that was going on right up to the time uh, the civil rights movement in the '60s. You know, right. it's, I mean, that, that's just yesterday. And so we've, we've made some progress. We, yeah. I mean, I'd like to be positive about it. It's not, it's not fast enough, mm -hmm. not good enough, but we're painfully trying to trying to get there. I, I do believe. Right. I do believe there are some good people in this country that are trying to do yeah. the right thing. You uh -huh. know? I think we got a lot of bad people too. And I think too many good people don't speak up. You know, and if the if the good people don't speak up, the bad guys win. It's really that simple. You, mm -hmm. know? I, you know, I guess everybody knows this, but sometimes you have to stress the obvious. Oh. Well, your recording list, uh, your discography is is really quite extensive. If you had a Decent success with record companies over the years, trying to play what you want. Record companies? I've never had a problem. I was with Prestige. Nobody told us what to play. Yeah. No, no in those days, the, in the days of the independence, I mean, they were quite willing to rip you off modestly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, okay. you, have to, you always have to give your tunes away in those days. Oh. I mean, that was part of the deal. That's okay. That was okay. I mean, I was, uh, at the time, I didn't understand it, but. We were never asked to compromise in, 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 uh, the music, never asked to compete with the majors. Whereas today, some of the big record companies, I don't, you know, now you're talking about a big rip, you know. Hmm. I mean, some of these kids with the limos and stuff, they think the record company is paying for the limos. No, kids, check the fine print. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it's multi, it's mega bucks now. I mean, you know, they want jazz to compete with all the other musics, and it's messing it up a bit, I think, you know. Instead yeah, of just I'd... being an art music, uh, we are not ready to accept, accept just an art music. And maybe we shouldn't. Maybe it should be a mass music, or at least more distribution. I don't know the, I'm not a businessman. I don't right. know, but uh, I do know that that uh, it's going to change, and I think the internet's going to change that. The whole technology is going to change that. The way we buy records is going to be completely different. I mean, for years and years and years, I heard about you know it's distribution. I can't get distribution. Well, that, you know, it all started with 78s. They're pretty heavy, you know. So there's only a few limited stores that had jazz. You have to go to New York to get them. I mean, I couldn't find jazz records in my, in my hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, then you get into LPs, and you still got bulk. You know what I mean? It's only kind of a specialty store. You're not going to find them in every Kmart and all that. Right. Uh, no, I, I, I think that the future, you're going to be able to just tap into through your, your computer and your hi-fi set, 
you want to get a Phil Woods record or a, any a Johnny Coates record or whatever, you just, you know, find it, mm -hmm. put a blank CD in there, and burn, and burn it, and you got it. You make up your own. It's happening already. Yeah. So there's no more problem about distribution. It'll solve that. I mean, all they need is one copy in a bank somewhere. You know. In other words, my music won't take up any more room than Sting's. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, you know, you think you about it though, that's, for, you don't have to compete for space, space. Yeah. for shelf space. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I'm also, I'm also hopeful, I don't know if I'll live to see this, but the equipment is getting so sophisticated, uh, the reproduction with the DAT tapes and the CDs and all that, that I, gotta, I, I have a, a dream that, the, that the, a, a sensitive listener will be able to tell the difference between a record that was recorded all together in a hall with the ambiance of everybody mm -hmm. playing together, because it sounds better. I mean, you know, nothing like like, like hearing a band all live, you yeah. know. Uh, and you can always tell that there's a musician can tell the difference between that and a layered well, one that takes you know eight months to make. Right. <laughs> you know? They add the bass this month and then right. the drums right. and then, you know. <laughs> That eventually people will put that on and say, "Ooh, that's awful. That's one of those layered records." <laughs> you know? Which means that the only people that are going to be able to make records are the people that can read and do it quickly. And when they're no longer eight months to make a record, mm -hmm. man, you do it the way we used to do it. You go in and do it in a week or yeah. three days, uh, and you've got to be a good musician. Uh, yeah. You know, now it's, it's so much lame, lame stuff. I mean, in the old days, even even the even garbage music was played by good musicians. Mm. You know, whether you were Guy Lombardo or Vaughn Monroe, same guys could go, could go with Woody Herman right. and, and cut it, or a polka band or any or a symphony, they could do it all. Uh, it's not that way. Yeah. You know, just look at Berkeley where they got 40,000 guitar players, man, who can't even tune up, you know. I mean, you know, perfect ears, no holes. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> And where do those people end up? You know? Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess playing, doing their thing, and that's fine, you know, but it's got, yeah. I don't know what it's got to do with jazz, and I don't know why you have to. It's a big clearinghouse. I'm, there's some very fine players up there, don't get me wrong, but a lot of it is uh, it's done for bread. Who, who wants to go to a poor school? Right. Let me ask you about uh, a, a couple musical instances. I have a couple things on tape here. Okay. I thought I would play for you and uh, maybe just get your comment. December 67. <laughs> Beautiful. Let me ask you, first of all, some of those scales coming down that you were playing. I'm not sure how to ask this question, but... I tell you, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> okay. You know, that's not the first time that's been said to me. <laughs> I know. It's, it's... Uh, did you know what they were? Did you know what those scales yes. were? Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't I know, completely. I know what every note I play in relationship to whatever's going on. Okay. Means. Well, that's, that's that's answers my question. Yeah. So that. Not for, to say I don't make mistakes. Occasionally, come up with something different by mistake. Right. Here, but essentially, I know. I, I mean, I have a complete set of screwdrivers. Okay. <laughs> so if you playing, you decide to play a whole tone scale here or whatever. whatever. Yeah. That, that this is a I know my options as soon as I see whatever the chord symbol is okay. and I try to have the music, whatever the music the context is, I try to fit it into to that. And, and as I say, I've got all these screwdrivers. Okay, uh -huh. well, this one will work nice. You know, uh -huh. Well, maybe that one, you know. The hardest thing about any art is you know that you can go this way or that way. It's making that choice. Uh -huh. What's the best choice? That's the, you know, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Uh, but you know, having a lot of choices is a good thing, but it can also drive you crazy. But if Lester Young had done the same you make sure kind of thing, I know he did, but do you believe 
that he thought of it the same way you did, or was it more of a intuitive? Oh, I think we're, I mean, you're talking about, he's a genius, man. I'm a craftsman. <laughs> so well, let's not mix up. Maybe we could argue about let's that. Let's not mix up apples and oranges here. Well, no, I mean, he was one of the, er, the first masters. I think he was operating on pure instinct, although he was a well-trained musician, as was mm -hmm. the whole family. I mean, that whole family was musicians. I'm sure that uh, all those piano lessons and all the kids and everybody playing stringed instruments and all that had to rub off. Mm -hmm. And Perez heard all kinds of scales from all kinds of different music and all kinds of different things. So, uh, plus his probably, you know, super normal ear. Uh, I'm not so sure that he even approached it any differently than, than uh -huh. anybody else did. Okay. I think a little more intuitive in the sense that he was first. There was no, I mean, I've had the benefit of him and Bird and everybody else that kind of, that invented jazz. But Prez was one of the early inventors. I mean, it hadn't mm -hmm. even been done yet. It was still... Yeah. Still fresh from Trombauer, you know. Mm. Well, this was a big influence on Benny Carter and Perez, oh. which is sometimes overlooked by history. Yes, sometimes you'll see. At least I've seen it mentioned from Lester. Which is very interesting, I yeah. find, you know. Yeah. Do you recall the first time you heard Trumbauer? I came to the Austin High Gang late. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. I mean, as a Charlie Parker man. I kind of started there and then, right, and then later on went back. Right. Well, that particular and, recording with, with Quincy. Um, Quintessence. Was, yeah. Yeah. Got to the West Coast well. for that. Huh? Did you go out to the West Coast? No, for no, that? that was done in New York. Oh. Oh, yes, before Quincy went to the West Coast. Uh huh. Uh, I was a contractor on that day. One of the few times Jerome Richardson wasn't the contractor. Oh. I swore I'd never do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I remember it was around Christmas time. We were running out of time, and I was the last tune. And we nailed it in one take, and everybody mm. was very happy to get home for the holidays without having And the record company was happy they didn't have to pay overtime. Oh, I see. <laughs> As a contractor, I was just happy to get the hell out of there. <laughs> really? You're but yeah, yeah, I remember very well. Wow. Um, you have a tone that, that's pretty recognizable, I have to say. I think so. You know, and, I think and, God bless me with that. Yeah. yeah. I do believe that that's, that's something you can work on to a a certain degree, uh, but if you're born with a bad tone, you're probably going to have a bad tone. For me. I mean, I don't think, yeah. I, I think, I think I was put on this earth to play the saxophone. I mean, I think I'm built, I, my physiognomy is kind of made to be a saxophone player. I, I mean, I, I, it didn't occur to me until much later, but. Uh, well, you and Cannonball. No, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, for whatever it's worth. I mean, I, I, I believe in, the, in fate in that, in that yeah, aspect of it because I could always get a good sound. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to work at it, although I did a lot of long tones, but I got a good tone right from the beginning. I was, I was lucky. I mean, I was blessed with a, with a natural embouchure. Yeah. I never had to scuffle with it. I never tightened up here. I always breathed from the diaphragm. I've always tried to, the pitch was pretty well centered, and that's, that's something that, you know, that's in the genes, I think, that comes from your your parents and all that, and the, my right. parents love music, and that, I think it, that shows. Yeah. Some little quote I remember from one critic, and they commented on your placement in bebop, and that you played more in tune than almost all of them. That was a nice Well, that's nice a nice comment. thing to, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. that all of them. It's important. Uh, here's another little cut. I thought we could... A little sharp occasionally. <laughs> Speaking of intonation, I think it's the tape player. <laughs> Everything was wearing off. <laughs> Let me, uh, let me read what something you said about this. Uh, this is the Sun Suite, yeah. correct? You said, the entire suite covers much of my musical stages, from Juilliard to Charlie Barnett's band, to a beach on the Riviera, to starving to death in California. Uh, first of all, it seems a shame to me that Phil Woods would be starving to death in California. Oh, the year I spent in California, I made yeah. three three thousand dollars, man. Ooh. I mean, that might not be poverty level, but it's pretty close to it. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't looking to become a studio man there, yeah. but it didn't work out for me at all. Yeah. 
after the 10 months I spent in, uh, after, after being in Europe for five years with my own band, you know, to go back to California, I don't know what I was thinking. I just wasn't, I was, I wanted to have a swimming pool for some odd oh. reason. Yeah. Did you uh, have the family out there and yeah, everything? Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. oh yeah, Canoga Park. And it was, uh, it was a disaster. It was, time, it was a huh? disaster. In fact, after I was actually headed back to, uh, I didn't know exactly where I was going, but I, I was going back to France. I mean, my, I, I figured my sojourn in America, that's for $3,000 that year. I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going back where I understand what's happening. <laughs> and, but I wanted to stop in New York for a minute and just check everybody out. I stayed with Jerry Dodgen. Jerry Dodgen got a call from uh, Michelle Legrand's manager, and they had uh, two weeks at uh, Jimmy's, and Eddie Daniels could do the first week, and they were looking for a saxophone player. And Jerry said, well, I can't do it. But Phil's here, and they said, oh, great, you know. Uh -huh. So I got the second week at Jimmy's, and they were recording live. And uh, I did You Must Believe in Spring. And when people say, what's the most important solo to you? I, that, that one, emotionally, is very important mm -hmm. to me. Because that was, uh, that led to the, that led to the formation of Michelle's company with, I mean, that led to a contract with RCA. Uh -huh. And we formed Griffin Productions, and then uh, led to Images, which won the Grammy that that year. And so I was actually saved from going back to France by Michel Legrand, which wow. is all very ironic. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, man, you can't, you couldn't make this stuff Who, up. Who's writing this script? <laughs> I know. That's I know. Really creative. It's, a, it's a great script. Isn't it? <laughs> but that's the scoop on that. I yeah. Mean, I was I was headed home, and, and here I was saved by. Uh, a Frenchman. Uh -huh. It's kind of neat, and we enjoyed uh, a long, wonderful musical and uh -huh. friendly relationship, and, and yeah. continue to be good friends. Well, this piece, uh, the string parts, you said that uh, you were inspired or uh, emulating Stravinsky in a. I sense. used the uh, the melody from the first da 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 dee da. That's the tone row from. Uh, one of Stravinsky's early serial pieces. I used to know the name of it, but I'm just blanking out. But I found the tone row anyway, and that and it, it, it's it, it, that sparked mm -hmm. that that part of the piece. Uh, Do you remember when you recorded it, if it sounded like you thought it was going to? Yeah, I was very pleased with <laughs> it. Yeah, I was very pleased with it. It's so nice to have a. A project like that, yeah, you know, get free reign, budget, to, free reign to do what yeah. you want. Yeah, RCA was good in those days. In those days. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but they, I mean, they've got. We once did a we once did a project with the same company, uh, Seven Deadly Sins. We did this in 1977. It was supposed to be Seven Deadly Sins, circa 77. And I got seven different arrangers. Every I was passing out sins like the Pope, man. <laughs> and Micah Benny, Joe Rocasano, Pete Robinson. Uh, Chris Gunning, uh, and a couple more. I just said Gary Anderson, all young, kind of cutting edge writers, you know, with a huge orchestra. Uh, did the Seven Sins. I did a lot of soprano on it. I played very, it was, I was in really good shape on the soprano and real cutting edge, I mean, very deep stuff. I mean, wonderful music. And then after we finished up the Seven Deadly Sins, uh, I took it home and lived with it for a year, and then I wrote uh, bridging sections between each sin, and then we had dialogue. We had a, a poet write, and mm -hmm. there were three or four actors who would say something um, apropos yeah. in, in the bridging sections between each of the sins, you know, which were kind of like a connective, yeah. connective narrative. Uh, RCA has that and doesn't even know where it is. <laughs> it's never been never been issued, you know. Oh, RCA has got a Tom Harrell record. Uh, Tom Harrell did all the arranging, also with a large orchestra. Never been never been issued reissued. The Live at the Showboat, which I think is one of the best best records I've ever made. Absolutely, has never been reissued properly. Uh -huh. It was it was reissued under a Novus. Mm -hmm. But they emasculated it. They left all the good stuff off and kept the Stevie Wonder and the oh. kind of popish stuff, you know. Isn't it annoying to not, wouldn't it be great if uh, the person called you up and said, we're going to reissue this, would you come well, and no, make it, your it, suggestion? It, it, it doesn't surprise, yeah, it, it would be nice. But I mean, even worse than that was the year that won a Grammy. It, it won a Grammy and it was taken off the market six months later. Oh. I mean, they didn't even recall it to put the little sticker on it. Uh -huh. It just kind of languished in the bin, and then 
I mean, they wouldn't do it to any other music. You wouldn't mm -hmm. do it to polkas, to rock and roll, to classical. Why do you do it to jazz? Where do they get off? Or so, you know. Yeah. But anyway, in, during that period, RCA was doing real good stuff. But that was that was a direct result of uh, Michelle Legrand and mm -hmm. Griffin Productions. Yeah. Nat Shapiro was was involved in that. I don't know if you know who Nat Shapiro is. A great, nice writer. Mm -hmm. Good job. Do you write at the piano? No, mm, I sketch maybe. Yeah. No, I turn, no. I usually write on the couch. <laughs> or no, I mean, I usually when I'm practicing, I'll come across something I like, and I'll write. I have you know a lot of little notes and stuff, just little patterns. It's just something that I find right. intriguing, and then I'll take that to the keyboard and see where we can go harmonically with it. I mean, if it's worthy of pursuit, and then it might just sit there for a while. Uh, and then when I do get ready to write, I write at the computer. That way I can hear everything. Yeah. Uh, but the piece is usually finished. I should say I, I orchestrate at the computer. I, I, I have a pretty good idea of how the piece is going to go. Yeah. Occasionally, uh, I'll have to change or rewrite, but usually it's finished in my head before I even sit sit down at the at the mm -hmm. computer. But it's a lot of time with a horn and then at the keyboard and noodling and a lot of a lot of gestation, period. Um, you've dabbled with electronics in the past. Sure. Has it been uh, satisfying for you? Uh, it's not my strong suit, but I'm glad I checked it out. Yeah. I mean, I'm very interested. I'm, I'm always interested in what's going on, sure. Mm -hmm. But I think there comes a time when you say, enough of the new doodads and the whatever, you, you know, whatever the new stuff is. Uh, after playing for 50 years, you got to kind of find your strengths. And I think my strengths are in, in, in playing a song well and being able to improvise within a set of changes, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I'm not concerned with experimentation anymore. I'm just kind of trying to just get to the core of what I do, yeah. do best. What was your reaction uh, to music of Archie Shepp and, and Coltrane uh, in, in their latter parts of his career anyway? I was more... Ascension and, you know, Ornette. I was more smitten with Dolphy, who uh -huh. was a dear friend. Uh, I loved it. I love I love Anthony Braxton's stuff. I, I love what those guys are doing. It's a lot better than a bunch of old guys sitting around in a garage playing Scrapple. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm really tired of that. Uh -huh. Yeah, no. I mean, that's what that's what an artist does. Pushes it to the to the edge. Uh -huh. That's what John. Yeah, I, I'm all for that. Whether it's my cup of tea, has nothing to do with it. That's jazz right. is not, it should not be played to make other jazz people feel comfortable. That's a, that's a statement I'd like to hear again. <laughs> I mean... Do yeah, you understand what I'm saying, though? I mean, it, yeah. I, mean, I didn't agree. I mean, I wasn't interested in going where John Coltrane went, but I'm so glad he did. Uh -huh. uh, I think elements of what Train and, and uh, Ornette did, I, I utilized. I shouldn't say I didn't. I mean, that free, but nobody was freer than Charlie Parker, you know, and since I went to, uh, since I'm a well-trained musician, I mean, nothing's going to surprise my ears. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I've listened to Ives since I was a kid. I mean, I listened to Stravinsky since I was a kid. I mean, this, you know, right. there's no big deal about a plus nine, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or a polychord or, uh -huh. or Cecil banging the keyboard. Yeah. It's all been done, man. It's all been done. But to be able to say something and keep that identity uh -huh. that, that people like Train and Dolphy and Ornette did, that's, now that's art. That's, that we need more of. I'd like to hear more of that. John Zorn is, fits this category. Okay. He's got a, a band called Masada, and they, and it's got, it's funny. Uh, it'll go, he does a theme from Batman, and it'll go to a tune, and it'll go somewhere else. Just what we were talking about. Yeah. You know, yeah. big, wide palette, and spacey, and funny, and exciting. And, and he also writes, he writes for the Philharmonic, he writes string quartets, he writes movie music, I mean, he does it all, you know, this is, this is my kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more of that. I'm really not so interested in the, what Buddy Bolden sounded like, I couldn't care less. 
he let the man rest. <laughs> and I understand from people that were there say the cat couldn't blow his nose anyway. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to hear him. Okay, yeah. let's get on with it. All right. <laughs> You're not going to hear him. That's right. How much can we talk about? Yeah. Right. It's interesting because you look around the country and you, you know, you see the Bix Beiderbecke festivals. Still, uh, you know, we gotta cool. have, we have to have tributes all the time, an excuse uh -huh. to play jazz. You know? uh -huh. uh, it's why not just play? You know, well, it's it's a different world. I mean, I'm not sure jazz is is apropos anymore. I mean, I have my uh, I have my questions about whether it's going to be around or whether it's becoming extinct in the form that, that I know it. Uh -huh. I hope it does evolve into something, and I think it must. Otherwise, it's going to be like Dixieland in Switzerland. You know, everybody's got the red suspenders and mm -hmm. they all play this stuff. And bebop has just got that same problem. I mean, you know, the guys are still playing the wrong chords, man. <laughs> Having a wonderful time. They've been playing them wrong for so long, they think they're right, I guess. It's not going to, it's not going to get it on. But I mean, that's... There are also some very, very fine artists and you don't need too many of them to change the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, there certainly is enough experimentation that goes on in the rock world. You well, know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame that it can't. You haven't heard any? Well, I'd like somebody <laughs> what the hip hop guys are doing more uh -huh. than uh, what the rockers are doing. I, yeah. I, I still have trouble with the, those chords. I mean, I haven't heard any. Maybe I'm. It's not so much a, a chordal thing. I know. I guess it's just a music. mixture of, of uh, I guess, different musical influences. Oh, I'm sure there's, yeah. a, maybe there's a whole lot that I'm not aware of, man. I'm yeah. just, you know. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm, Let me mention a couple uh, other musicians that you may have rubbed elbows with, and uh, what's your impression of their... The raised around? elbows with. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Miles? Always very nice to me. Yeah. Always very kind. Yeah, in fact, Miles is probably more responsible for my career than a lot of people realize. When I uh, first signed with Prestige and I just did my first record, uh, Miles came by the office to see Bob Weinstock about something, and Bob had the mock-up of the uh, cover of my first record. And Miles said, I heard that guy at Birdland last night, he can play. Now, Bob Weinstock, Miles Davis is saying that the owner of the company, I can play? Mm. You know, I, who knows what a, what a, what a might have gone on if Miles had not given me that little boost, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was, as I say, always very kind. I, I never had any problem with Miles. Yeah. How about Cannonball? Mm -hmm. oh, guys my man, my yeah. man. Also very kind man. Yeah. Very funny man. Yeah, it broke my heart when he went. It really, really upset me. We were, we were pretty close. And he was very kind. He said some nice things about me, which I always appreciated. Right. One of the early supporters, and that meant, meant a lot from somebody of his caliber. I can't recall, did you guys ever have a chance to record together? We recorded uh, together, but I was just sitting in a section. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the big band thing, Oliver Nelson, I yeah. think it is, Abstraction, yeah. or I forget right. the name of the piece. Something. Domination. 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 Yeah. But we hung out a you lot. And probably Jerome was there. I got to know, the, I knew him well, well, I mean, I knew him real well in the fact that when I was working at the Nut Club, 53, 54, something like that, and Jackie McLean came by. Yes, Jackie was in the area, and we knew each other pretty well. She said, come on with me. I said, where are we? I said, come on. Went to the Bohemia. Now, you know, Bird had just died, so it had to be 55 or something, you know, whatever. Bird was gone. So Jackie and I figured we might get a gig now, you know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of cold, but nevertheless, yeah. <laughs> trying to find the positive in, the, in spite of the tragic loss. And we went in and uh, there was Oscar Pettiford's band. Yeah. And Cannonball was sitting, this guy was sitting in. And it was Julian. And I remember Jackie and I at the, at the back of the hall, and we're listening to this son of a bitch. <laughs> and in unison, we looked at each other and said, Oh shit! <laughs> like it was one voice. <laughs> oh shit! Where did this guy come from? He filled the hole, man. <laughs> we quick, <laughs> quick, baby. Yeah. But uh, what a man! And then I got to know him real well because when I moved to Europe, 
Uh, we did a tour where we used to open for Cannonball. Mm -hmm. The European Rhythm Machine would open and Cannonball would do the second half. And that, yeah. that was, we got a chance to travel and hang. Wow. That, was, that was great fun. How about Gil Evans? <laughs> did much too. Did the one recording with him. Yeah. But he used to come sit in at the nut club where I played the, mm -hmm. with, the, with the hammers, the, the strippers. He, he used to come sit oh, that's in. That's great. <laughs> yeah, because he, uh, Teddy, he'd bring Teddy Kotick, because it was, it was Nick Stabulous' gig, who was my drummer, and John Early was the trumpet player. And uh, occasionally Gil would, because mm -hmm. we'd have uh, jazz between shows and after, sh after the shows, and it went pretty late. So Gil used to come and sit in, so I knew him pretty well. Yeah. And we did, I did the one project, the one record with him. <coughs> I forget the name of it, but. Uh, yeah. And you've had your your forays into the, the pop uh, field as a soloist um, with yeah. the Billy Joel thing. Billy Joel, I did Paul yeah. Simon, yeah. still crazy after all these years. Uh, Phoebe Snow, a couple others that elude me at the moment. Mm -hmm. Can you recall when you when you did the thing on uh, just the way you are? Sure. How many how many takes did you get? On oh, that? one or two tops. Two and then they. they oh yeah, chose it was just me and Phil Ramon in the booth. Yeah, yeah. And he had the changes written on the back of a matchbook cover or something. Yeah. But it was like a pop tune. I mean, uh, a pop tune in the sense of uh, a Broadway Tin Pan Alley kind of song. It wasn't really a rock and roll song. Right. I, thought. I mean, right. it's really it's really a pretty nice tune. Yeah. So it was not a it was not a problem. Uh huh. Yeah, I did the same. I did Phoebe Snow's over, overdub and uh, Billy Joel on the same day. No kidding. The same half hour. Oh, because was, was he producing both of those? Yeah. 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 He, same he, half hour. Yeah, and I got seven hundred dollars <laughs> right. for both things, three fifty apiece. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> and a Grammy thing out of. You know, that in those days, I mean, from Mike Brecker on. Uh, from that period, you know, when, when, when they would use soloists, it was kind of SOP. You'd ask for a, a, a quarter of a point. Mm -hmm. If a tune from the album was taken out and made a single, you'd get a quarter of a cent on every single that they made taken from the album, if you're the soloist on okay. it. My manager didn't know anything about this stuff, and I sure didn't know anything about it. But you know, if I if, if that if that if we we could have got it, all we had to do was ask. And you know you know how much a billion quarter of a pennies are. <laughs> that's a lot of money, man. Isn't that something? I mean, that's record sold over a billion. That's the biggest selling record of all times. Wow. But that, you know, I, I would have had the money, but I wouldn't have had such a good story. <laughs> that's true. It does come off nice on tape. But I, but I, I've heard, I've heard my solo played. All, I've heard it played by lounge bands yeah. in, in Poland. You yeah. know, <laughs> and I always go and say, uh, I am Phil Woods. Nice job on my solo. You know, <laughs> they people crack wow. up. But I've heard it in Canada, and Mexico, you name it. You know, I've heard. I got a lot of mileage on it. The best. It's a young saxophone player came up to me once and he says, are you the guy in the Billy Joel record? I said, yes, I am, young man. He said, have you done anything on your own? <laughs> I said a couple of things. Good. That's a good one. That's a real good one. It's true, true, um, all true. I, I, I found another quote that I liked from you. And uh, it was, I think, in regard to this, <coughs> the Sun Sweet record. And, uh, after talking about the music, said, I'm going to wait and see if it touched the public because that, after all, is the big kick. So Touching someone, yeah. Yeah. You're, the public response to your work is, uh, and it almost goes without saying, but not in all cases with musicians. I have a nice support group. I mean, you got to remember that, not remember, but uh, like, for instance, Bill Goodwin, Steve Gilmore, and I, we've been working together for 20 six years now. Now, we're not household names, but we have a very nice audience around the world because we've, mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've garnered the audience the old-fashioned way. We've gone around for 25 years playing in small joints for 100 and 200 people at a time. So when we go back, we get maybe 250. I mean, it's not the mega bucks that anybody's interested in, but nevertheless, if I could sell them all a record, I'd be <laughs> very happy, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, that answers my question. <laughs> but I think that's the best way to build an audience. 
And that's the most rewarding thing of all. I mean, to, to some couple will come up and they say, we were married to Round Trip, or you know, we, your music means so much to us. I mean, that, come on, you know, I love, believe me, I'm honored to get prizes and all that, but to, to, have, to have the music mean something mm -hmm. to people on that level, that's, you can't buy that, man. Right. That, that ain't for sale. And you've got a jazz tutor program out. Yeah. For on CD, CD round. round. Yeah. yeah. Not moving as well as we'd like it, but, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen anybody doing one any better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a great product. Uh, I recommend it to kids. It's uh, under 100 bucks. Uh -huh. It's got my whole method in there because I, I no longer teach. I've taught pretty near 50 years. But yeah, with uh, my, uh, my dentist, actually, Dr. Phil Terman, who's a very fine clarinetist, was the guy who sponsored it. It was the, the bread man mm -hmm. who paid for it. He's quite a computer guy, and his son was a great programmer. So that's where we did the CD round. Okay. But it's not for Mac, so it doesn't get much play in the schools. Uh, but it gets more play in Europe. Spain, they love it for some odd reason. Hmm. Australia, it's doing very well. Yeah. Uh, but not as well as we like. But we have, uh, it's still in, still in the catalog. Cool. Have any uh, future projects coming up that uh, you'd like to mention? Future projects? Yeah, I want to do uh, a four alto thing. I toured with it in Europe uh, about a year ago. It was uh, John Gordon, uh, he didn't tour, but the, the record recording would be uh, John Gordon, Vince Herring, and uh, Jesse Davis and myself, four altos. I've already written the music. I want to do that. I want to do a second big band album with the festival orchestra. We just did a gig at the at the uh, college here a couple of nights ago. I got a whole bunch of new music. I'm ready for that. I want to do a second album uh, and just keep keep on keeping on uh -huh. as best I can. Jazz has been pretty good to you. Oh yeah, when no, I, been, I have no complaints. You've been real good I to jazz. No, I think. It's yeah. been uh, it's been a great it's been a great life. Do you have I'm advice for you know, aspiring jazz musician in, uh, that might help them in their careers? Well, advice for a young jazzman, no. <laughs> I figure that if, if, they, if they're gonna do it, no matter what I say, they're gonna do it. It's for those ones in between, those ones that aren't really sure. Those are the ones I, I worry about. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think jazz is only for those that have no choice. Uh, I think if you're a young man and you're entertaining thoughts of becoming a brain surgeon or a jazz tenor man, I'd go with the brain surgery, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if you have a choice, if you if you got two burning desires, don't yeah. pick jazz. Yeah. I mean, keep playing it. I mean, so, sometimes I... I, I, I envy the amateur, mm -hmm. like all those dentists and doctors who play for kicks. They don't have to worry about making bread out of it. They really enjoy making music. Right. And that's really what it's about. Yeah. Never forget that joy that the first time you made a note and it made, made you feel good. Some musicians kind of forget that stuff. You know, they've been sitting in the pit and reading the Wall Street Journal and grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. <laughs> they forgot that feeling, that, yeah. that burn, that burn in the belly when it, when it, the first time they sounded decent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's easy to, it's easy to get kind of trapped into just making some bread and trying to exist, and the bloom is off the rose. And that, that. Uh -huh. but a, a young man should, should uh, consider. You only have one life when you make a choice, a career decision. It should be well thought out. Not too carefully structured, mind you, but I wouldn't rush into anything. I wouldn't uh -huh. rush to go to a jazz school or any university. I, I always recommend take a year off, man. Hitchhike around the world. Take your horn and see if you can play for your supper all around the world. See what life is about. But while you can, before you have a family, before you need bread, you know, get a couple of thou and just do it. Yeah. Just do it, man. Take a chance, you know, because you might never have a chance to do it, and that's when you can really kind of get inside your head. You know, it's mm -hmm. hard to do it when you're surrounded by your peers or your family or the pressures of a society that you know. Go somewhere where it's all fresh and pursue your muse or, or 
Let's find out who you are. And then, when you decide, you're going to be a much better player yeah. for, this, for this experience. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you just gave some good advice in spite of yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> there goes my image yeah. <laughs> as the curmudgeon. Uh, just to wrap up, if, if you had um, <clears throat> someone at our school or, or whomever is watching the tape and said, man, this, he's got a lot of great things to say, I think I'd like to listen to, to Phil Woods. Could you pick out five or so of your favorite recordings? Well, I mentioned Showboat I like very much. I like yeah. to live at Jimmy's with Michelle Legrand because of the emotional import of the, of uh, You Must Believe in Spring. Uh, images, I think. Uh, Flores de Canto, I like some of the orchestral things. Anything about the, with the quintet, I'm really proud of yeah. all the quintet stuff. I mean, uh, whether it's with Al Crook or Tom Harrell or Brian Lynch, I, I, uh, we, we spend a great deal of time grooming our records. We try to make the very best product we can. And I think we've, 90%, I think we succeeded. I'm not embarrassed by any of the quintet recordings. Uh -huh. I'm not generally embarrassed about any musical endeavor, except maybe Greek cooking. <laughs> <laughs> But luckily, you can't find that one either. <laughs> I, let me see if I have this. Um, one of my favorite tunes off this was uh, A Sleepin' Bee. Sleepin' Bee, I knew you were going to play that. You did, huh? Did you have a feeling when you did this record that, yeah, you know, oh, we got to yeah, play it in the can? I think it felt pretty good, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did. It was that was a great period. Yeah, and uh, you had the you know the extra fellows, uh, guitarist and. Uh, well, no, Harry was a regular member of uh -huh. the band. No, Harry was a regular member. We just added the percussionist because of the Brazilian suite. Right. A lot of. Uh, a lot of people like the idea that I started cheek to cheek with the uh, Iber, <laughs> 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 the cadenza. All oh, right. Sh showing my <laughs> how hip I am. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a bear of a piece in itself. Yeah. Yeah. That came out well. But yeah, this is it's a good band. But I like Flash. Mm -hmm. Flash for Concord, I think, came out very well. I like the little big band stuff. They're all my kids, man. I mean, yeah. you know, we put a lot of care and love into making records. Right. It's, it's hard to, to, to pick the desert island one. Mm -hmm. Bring them all. <laughs> right. And they're not 78, so it's not that, that That's big right. a deal. They make a nice stocking stuffer. <laughs> right. All right, well, I really appreciate you coming out here My today. pleasure, Mark. I enjoyed chatting you know, with you. It's nice to sit in this kind of historical little atmosphere well, it's here. there's a lot of history here, man. You'll have to keep me informed when your festival is. Make sure you pick up a... A catalog and uh, get a, get on the mailing list yeah. here. We right. have some great stuff here. I really okay. do. Good music. Thanks Enjoy so it. much. Thank you.